Many years ago, in days long past, there lived in the country between China and India a young girl named Scheherazade. She had read a thousand books of histories and chronicles and stories, so that her memory was filled with the sayings of kings and wise men and poets. One day her father, who was the vizier of the sultan, returned to his home looking downcast and troubled. Why are you so ill at ease, father? Oh, know this, dear daughter, that in all the world there is no office more burdensome than the vizier to the sultan. Because he was deceived and injured by a wife whom he loved and trusted, he has decreed that each new wife shall live only as long as she is in his presence. He therefore marries girl after girl, marrying one in the evening and in the morning having her head cut off. Is it a wonder then that I am full of sorrow? Oh, my father, take me and bring me to the sultan that I may be his bride. What? What foolishness is this? Do not speak such nonsense. But father, if I can be the means of saving the girls of this land from death, and thereby ridding fathers and mothers of the anxiety that oppresses them, will I not bring honor upon you and upon me forever? At last the vizier agreed, and in despair went to the palace of the sultan. Tomorrow night I will bring you Scheherazade to be your wife. What? Have you made up your mind to sacrifice your own daughter to me? Sire, it is her own wish. Mm. Yeah, then bring her to me. But don't expect mercy because you are the vizier. I will obey you, sire. Though a father, I am also your subject. And so the vizier returned to tell Scheherazade that she was to come to the palace the following night. When she received the news, she immediately called her sister to her. My dear sister, tomorrow our father takes me to the palace, where I am to become the bride of the sultan. Can it be? Uh, are you to be sacrificed by our father? No, no, it is my own request. Oh. Listen carefully to what I say. When his highness receives me, I shall beg him one last favor, and that will be to allow you to sleep in our chamber. One hour before the dawn, awaken me with these words. My sister, if you are not asleep, I beg you before the sun arises to tell me one of your charming stories. Mm -hmm. Then I shall begin. And by this means, I hope to deliver the people from the terror that reigns over them. The following night, the vizier took his daughter to the sultan, who was pleased with her beauty. But there were tears in her eyes, and he saw that she was sad. What is the matter, my bride? <sighs> Sire, I have a sister who loves me as tenderly as I love her. Grant me the favor of allowing her to sleep this night in the same room, since it will be the last night we shall be together. Hmm. Hmm, so be it. So the sister was sent for, and she spent the night in the room with the sultan and his bride. Then, an hour before daybreak, she awoke Scheherazade, and in a full voice spoke to her. Dear sister, if you're not asleep, Tell me, I pray, one of your charming stories before the sun rises. It's, it's the last time I shall have the pleasure of hearing you. Will your highness permit me to do as my sister asks? <sighs> Willingly. <clears throat> this is the story of Aladdin and the Wonderful Lamp. There once lived a poor tailor who had a son called Aladdin, a careless, idle boy who would do nothing all day but play in the streets. He was disobedient to his father and mother and refused to learn any trade or even assist his father. This so grieved the father that he died, but still Aladdin did not change or mend his ways. One day, as he was playing in the street as usual, a stranger approached him. A young man, is not your father Mustafa, the tailor? Yes, sir, he was, but 
he is now dead. <gasps> oh, my son. I am your uncle. Uncle? Your worthy father was my own brother. For many years I have been away. And now when I return, I learn that my poor brother is dead. Yes. <laughs> I knew you from your likeness to my dear brother. Now go to your mother and tell her I am coming. Mother, mother, have I an uncle? No, child, you have no uncle. I just met a man in the street who says he is my uncle, my father's brother. He cried when I told him father was dead, and he bid me come to you and tell you that he will pay you a visit. Well, well, your father had a brother, but I always thought he was dead. I know of no other brother. But why should he give me this money? Ten pieces of gold! Well, go and bring him to us, for uh, perhaps he is your uncle. Soon Aladdin returned with a stranger, who brought wine and fruit as a gift. Is this my dear dead brother's wife? Show me the place where dear Mustafa used to sit, that I may fall down and kiss it. Oh, we did not know that Mustafa had another brother. Oh, I'm not surprised. I have been in foreign lands for these 40 years. And what a blow to me to return to find that my brother is dead. I recognized his features in the face of my nephew when I beheld him in the street. Yes, yes, Aladdin bears the features of his father. And what trade do you follow, Aladdin? Oh, well, he's an idle fellow and has taken up no trade. Oh, my son, you must think of learning a trade. If you do not like your father's, then take another. I will assist you. If you do not like to work with your hands, perhaps you could take a shop where you could buy and sell all sorts of merchandise. Oh. What do you say? I, I think I would like to do that. To have fine linens and cloth of all kinds would be a splendid business. Then it shall be done. Tomorrow you shall be bought a fine suit of clothes and we shall look about the city. Oh, good. Then the stranger left. And Aladdin and his mother were certain that this was a long-lost uncle, for otherwise why should he show such kindness to them? The next day he arrived to take Aladdin to purchase a new suit of clothes and to show him the sights. Again the following day he took Aladdin out beyond the city, pointing out the beautiful buildings and splendid gardens and even the Sultan's palace. And by degrees the stranger led Aladdin far beyond the city, until they came near to the barren hill country. Uncle, whither are we going? There are no gardens here, nor beautiful buildings. Let us return to the town. Oh, not yet, my son, for we shall soon see a garden, the like of which you have never before seen, greater by far than even the Sultan's. Oh. But sit thee down and rest, and I will divert thee with wonders whose like no one in the world ever saw before. But first, gather together some wood chips and sticks for a fire. Forgetting his fatigue, Aladdin began to gather wood together for a fire, anxious to witness the magic his uncle promised to perform. Then, the stranger brought out a small casket from his pocket. When he had started the fire, he poured the powders upon the flame as he muttered words which none might understand. A great cloud of black smoke arose, and suddenly the earth shook, and the rocks trembled, and there was a great bellowing like thunder. Then the ground divided, revealing a marble slab with a copper ring in the center. If you do as I bid thee, Aladdin, you shall become wealthier than any of the kings or even the sultan. I... I... I'm afraid, Uncle. 
How did you open the earth? Ah, do not fear, O oh son of my brother. By my spells and magic did I open the earth. Under that marble stone lies a great treasure. However, none but you, Aladdin, has the power to remove the stone and set foot within this enchanted treasury which lies below. Hmm? Oh, oh, uncle, I am willing to do as you say. Seize the ring and remove the marble slab. But, uncle, I surely cannot raise it alone. If you will but assist me... None can touch the stone but you. Seize the ring and pull it, and it will come easily under your hand. Uh, there. Look, Uncle, here are twelve steps leading into a cavern. Go down and with all care into the vault, Aladdin, until you reach the bottom. There you will find four halls, and in each you will see four golden jars, jars. and others of silver. silver. Beware, however, that you do not touch them or take anything from them, but proceed swiftly to the last hall. I shall. If you hesitate or touch one of the jars, you will be transformed into a black stone. <gasps> oh, I will do exactly as you say. Where should I go from the fourth hall? There you will find a door which leads into a beautiful garden filled with fruit-bearing trees. Oh. Enter this garden and walk along the path until you arrive at an open room with a lamp hanging from the ceiling. Lamp. Climb the ladder which you will also find and remove the lamp. Pour out its contents and place it in thy breast pocket. As you return, you may pluck from the trees whatever you like, but hold fast to the lamp. Do you understand? Yes, Uncle. Here, take this magic ring upon your finger, and it shall preserve you from danger if you do exactly as I have said. Beautiful. Now go, Aladdin, for you are about to become one of the richest of men. <laughs> So Aladdin descended the stairs into the cavern where he found the four great halls. Carefully he passed the golden jars until he had entered the garden at the end of the last hall. Walking along the path, he finally came to the open room where he found the lamp, which he brought away as he had been instructed. As he returned along the path through the garden, he observed the trees more closely. Instead of fruit, each tree held costly gems of brilliant hues, diamonds and emeralds and rubies. Aladdin walked among the trees, dazzled by their radiance, but unaware of their enormous value. I will collect a few of these glass fruits for my amusement when I return home. When he had gathered much of the strange fruit and put it into his pockets and wrapped it within his robe, he hurried back through the halls to the steps where he had entered. Weighted down with the jewels, Aladdin called to his uncle from the bottom of the steps for aid. Uncle, uncle, lend me your hand that I may climb out of this cavern of mystery. Hand me the lamp, oh my son, and that will lighten your load. Oh, it is not the lamp, uncle, that weighs me down. Help me out and I will give you the lamp. Hey, nay, give me the lamp at once. But, Uncle, I will give it to you as soon as I have climbed out of this place. The lamp is placed under the treasure I have brought forth, and I cannot easily reach it. Ah, then you shall remain within forever. Let the earth be no more divided. <laughs> Suddenly the earth shook, and the rocks cracked, and the entrance to the cavern was sealed shut. Uncle! 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 Help me! Do not leave me, Uncle! But the stranger had no intention of helping Aladdin escape from the cavern. He was angry that his plan to secure the lamp had failed. For long ago, he had learned by magic that this immense hoard existed and that only by the help of another could he secure the lamp. This wonderful lamp possessed great power, and whosoever was its master could not be surpassed or defeated by any monarch on earth. 
So Aladdin found himself imprisoned in the cavern with nothing but darkness and four walls surrounding him. For the stranger had by magic locked the doors both to the entrance and to the halls behind him. Then he departed, leaving Aladdin to die. Uncle, 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 do not forsake me, uncle. For three days he sat in darkness with neither food nor drink. But on the third day, as Aladdin rubbed his hands together in sorrow, crying to Allah his God, his fingers rubbed the enchanted ring which had been given him when he entered the cavern. Thy slave between thy hands is come. Ask whatever you want, for I am the slave of him who wears the ring. Oh, uh, I, I, I desire, O oh slave of this ring, to return to the face of the earth. It shall be done, O oh master. Instantly the earth divided, and again the entrance to the cavern appeared before Aladdin. Slowly he arose and emerged from the cavern into the bright daylight. After a time he came to his own house, weak and hungry and sick at heart. The stranger was no uncle mother, but a liar and a wizard, and he, he tried to take my life. Oh, my son. Oh, I feared that you were dead when you did not return, nor did this evil man come again. He is a conjurer and a sorcerer, oh. and the devils under the earth are not as damnable as he. Mm. But first let me eat and rest, Mother. Then will I tell you of the wondrous things that I have beheld since last I saw you. Afterwards, Aladdin told his mother all that had befallen him since he had left with the false uncle describing the way the earth gaped and the hills split at the stranger's wizardry. But Aladdin did not tell his mother about the genie who had helped him escape. Then Aladdin slept. Late the next day he awoke, rested but hungry. I have a great hunger, Mother. Bring me something to eat. Oh, my son, we have nothing left in the house. Oh, Oh, but uh, I have some yarn which I will sell in the marketplace. No, Mother. Keep the yarn. Bring me the lamp that I brought from the cavern. I will sell it and buy food. Oh, Aladdin, it, it's filthy. Why, oh, let me clean and polish it that it will bring a better price. Then, taking a handful of sand, she began to rub the lamp. But suddenly, a giant genie arose filling the room with his frightful bulk. What is thy wish? I am the slave of the lamp. I am but one of many. What is thy wish, master? Aladdin's mother quaked in fear when she looked at the frightful form, and never having seen such a thing before, stood speechless, and then she fainted. But her son, having had some experience with the genie of the ring, rushed into the room when he heard the genie's voice, and snatching the lamp from her hand, spoke. <clears throat> o slave of the lamp, I am hungry, and it is my desire that you fetch me something to eat, and, and let it be something toothsome beyond our dreams. <laughs> <laughs> Thy wish is my command, master. In a twinkling, the genie returned with a silver tray, and upon it stood twelve golden platters of meats and dainties. There were silver cups and crystal decanters full of wine, and after setting all these things before Aladdin, the genie vanished. Mother, mother, rise and eat. Almighty Allah has eased our poverty. What what has happened? Who has brought this feast? <laughs> oh, oh, it must be the Sultan who has seen our wine. This is no time for questioning, Mother. Come, we are both famished. And so they both ate until they were full. And when they had finished their meal, the mother again began to wonder about the strange event that had occurred. <laughs> <laughs> 
I'm frightened of such spirits, my son. Tell me truthfully, was it a genie who saved you from the false uncle? Yes, mother, but it was the genie of the ring. <gasps> the spirit you beheld was the slave of the lamp. Oh, oh, I beg you, Aladdin, throw away this lamp and your ring. Throw it away. Oh, they will bring us only sorrow, sorrow, genies. As our prophecy told us, our only devil. No, mother. Let the curse be upon my head if any evil come from this. No. But you have seen with your own eyes what may come. Have we not eaten? And in plenty? Mm. Did not the magician who pretended to be my uncle desire the lamp above all other things, knowing its priceless value? Mm. Therefore, mother, it is wisdom for us to keep the lamp, but we must not disclose its mysteries to others. Do as you wish, my son. But when you summon the genie, see that you do so when I'm not present. <laughs> I do not wish to see that frightful spectacle again. All right, mother. One day, as Aladdin was in the marketplace, he heard the crier passing through the streets with a proclamation. By command of our magnificent master, the Sultan... Let all the folk lock up their shops and stores and retire within their houses. For the Sultan's daughter, Princess Padralbudur, shall pass by on her way to the baths. Whoever disobeys shall be put to death. Hmm. All men speak of the beauty and loveliness of the Sultan's daughter. I will see her face for myself. And so Aladdin contrived a plan and hid himself behind the door to the baths. And when the princess Badral Budur raised her veil, Aladdin gazed in wonder at the beautiful girl. His strength was struck down from the moment he saw her, and love got hold of the whole of his heart. When he returned to his home, his mother thought him ill. My son, what has been? In you, why, your face is like, like marble. Oh, oh let me be. Well, if you have need, oh. let me bring the physician. There is a skillful leech who is close at hand. Oh, I am well in body, mother. Oh, good. But I thought all women resembled thee until I beheld the Princess Badral Budur. Oh, oh, oh my oh. foolish son, did you not hear the crier? Why, if you had been found out, you would have been slain. Oh, mother, I have been slain oh. by the beauty of the princess. I am determined that I shall win her for my wife. Hey, child, child, have you lost your senses? Why, why, who could undertake to propose such a thing to the sultan? Why, who is fonder and more faithful to me than you? Oh, no, no. Yes, it is my plan that you shall take my offer to the sultan. I have learned that the ornaments that I plucked from the trees in the enchanted garden are the costliest gems in the world. This treasure from the hidden hoard will I present as a gift. I have arranged them in this bowl, which you shall carry as a gift to the king when you make my proposal. So compose your thoughts and take this bowl and go tomorrow to the palace. Early the next morning, Aladdin's mother carefully wrapped the bowl and made her way to the palace. In the council chamber there were viziers and emirs and noblemen of all ranks. And one Take by one away. petitioners came before the sultan to plead for this cause and that. Aladdin's Get mother on, stood close on. by, but she could not gain an audience with the, the sultan, sultan because of the crowd. Finally the sultan left and the crowd dispersed and Aladdin's mother returned home. Again and again she went to the palace but never did she speak to the sultan for a whole month. But the sultan noticed her there day after day and remarked to the grand vizier. Oh, vizier, for many days have I observed the old woman yonder bearing something in that cloth. What is her purpose here? Yes, sir, she seems a woman of weak wit. Do not trouble yourself with her. Well, bring her forth, nevertheless, for I would hear her case. 
To hear is to obey, sire. Oh, woman, come forward at once. Now, what is your wish? O oh, King of Time and, and Lord of the Age, I have a want. Mm. Oh, first, will you grant me a promise that I may speak openly without harm? You may speak freely, woman, with the safety of Allah Almighty. I have a son named Aladdin, mm. feeling an uncontrollable longing to look upon the face of Princess Badral Pudur. He hid himself near the baths. Hmm. When she entered, he beheld her. But, oh, but, oh, king of the age, since that hour, life has not been pleasant for him. And, and he has required of me that I ask you for her hand in marriage. Uh, nor could I drive this fancy from his mind. Therefore, be mild and merciful, and pardon this boldness on the part of me and my son. <laughs> and uh, what may be in that cloth you carry? Oh, oh, it is a gift my son sends thee, O oh, Sultan. Then did Aladdin's mother unwrap the bowl containing the priceless gems and presented it to the Sultan. Mm. <gasps> ah! Never until this day have I seen such jewels. What sayest thou, Vizier? <laughs> have you ever before seen such gems as these? <laughs> Never saw I such, sire, for size and beauty and excellence. The man who gives such gifts is worthy to be the husband of the Princess Badralbudur. Ah, Sultan. I beg of you that you do not act rashly. Huh? Indeed, it is a magnificent gift. But promise me you will not give the princess in marriage for three months, that my own son may present his gift to thee, one yet costlier than this. <laughs> it shall be done as you request, vizier. Ah. Woman, go to thy son and tell him I have pledged my word that the princess Badralbudur shall be his in three months' time. Quickly she departed and returned and told Aladdin the whole story. Great was his joy at the news, and he thanked his mother and praised Allah Almighty for his happiness and good fortune. Two of the three months passed, and one day Aladdin's mother went to the marketplace, but found the shop shut tight and the Sultan's guard riding through the streets with lighted torches. Sir, tell me what be the tidings in town this day that such a celebration should be held. I suppose you are a stranger and not of this city. No, I'm a citizen here, but I've heard of no holy day. This very night, the son of the Grand Vizier is to marry the Sultan's daughter. The mother grieved as she heard these words, and straightway she returned home to tell Aladdin. The Grand Vizier's son shall have little joy in his marriage. Have you forgotten, mother, that I still possess the lamp? Hmm. Leave me then. <laughs> All will be well. Rapidly the mother left. And Aladdin took down the enchanted lamp and rubbed it. What is thy wish? I am the slave of the lamp. I am but one of many. What is thy wish, master? The Sultan has promised me his daughter, but he has broken his word. This very night, the vizier's son is to marry her. Now this is what I command. When the wedding celebration has ended and the bride and groom retire, bring them here, bed and all. Mm, it shall be done, Lord of the Lamp. Your wish is my command. That is all for the present. Later that night, after the festivities at the palace, the Princess Badral Budur and the Grand Vizier's son were preparing for bed when suddenly the genie appeared, huge and awesome. In a swirl of smoke and vapor, the genie carried the pair across the city to the humble home of Aladdin. 
It is done, Master, as you have commanded. Carry this caged bird and place him in the back room by himself. Hmm. I shall breathe upon him a blast so cold that he will shrivel and shake with freezing. Excellent. Take him away. I'll return tomorrow morning. I hear and obey. In the morning, the genie transported the bride and bridegroom back to the palace. And when the sultan went in to greet them, his daughter only frowned and said nothing. And the grand vizier's son had taken a cold, looking pale and weary. The sultan told this to his wife, who immediately went to see for herself. Good morning, daughter. Well, from your looks, it seems that some strange matter has occurred to trouble you so. <laughs> Tell me, what has happened that makes you so morose and speechless? Pardon me, O oh mother, for my silence and my stare, but I have spent the vilest of nights. Really? You'll not believe me. But hardly had we lain down, Mother, when a giant form appeared and lifted our bed and carried it to a dark and loathsome place. Then, then did this spirit blow a blast upon my husband that turned him blue with cold. Oh, we spent the night apart. And when the sun touched the palace tower, we were brought back again. Oh, my child, say no more. Tell no one else, or they may think you have lost your wits. And don't tell your father. Mother, mother, I have not lost my wits. This is what happened. And if you do not believe me, ask my bridegroom. The sultaness left, urging her daughter to say nothing about these strange events, but to join in the celebration as if nothing had happened. Then she sent secretly for the vizier's son, and asked him about the matter. My daughter has told me a strange story. Tell me, are the words of the Princess Baldrabudu truthful? My lady, I have no knowledge of anything strange. Hmm. Well, uh... Perhaps the princess has seen some vision or dream. Mm. Mm. Now the vizier's son did not wish to lose his bride. Therefore, he would not admit the truth. But that night, again Aladdin summoned the genie, who, at his command, brought the married couple again to the home of Aladdin, where they spent the night as before. morning, the sultan again visited the chambers of his daughter, and again he found the princess looking sour and sad, when she should have looked joyful. Then the sultan waxed wroth, and bared his sword. What is this? Tell me what has happened, or I shall let you feel the steel of this blade. Speak! Oh, oh my father! Be not angry with me, nor hasty in thy hot passion. When I tell thee what has happened these last two nights, you'll pity me and pardon my silence. Then did the princess tell her strange tale to her father, who immediately summoned the grand vizier's son. It is my desire to know the facts of this strange case. Out of fear, my daughter may not know what really befell her. <laughs> oh, Sultan... Heaven forbid that the princess should be thought to speak falsely. <laughs> Indeed, all that she said was true, and these two nights have proved to be the evilest nights of our lives. <laughs> all night I lay in a black hole, noisy and smelly and truly damnable, and my ribs cracked with the cold. For a giant spirit did breathe upon me his petrifying wind. <laughs> well, 
In this case, I declare the marriage null and void. Oh, thank you, my lord. <laughs> Cause the rejoicing to cease. The marriage is broken off. After the marriage of the princess had ended so suddenly and unhappily, still the sultan did not think of his pledge to give his daughter to Aladdin. But the young Aladdin had not forgotten, and when the third month was up, he again sent his mother to the palace. When the sultan saw her, standing where she had been before, he remembered his promise to her concerning the marriage after a term of three months. Secretly, he turned to the Grand Vizier for his advice. O oh, Vizier, there is the ancient dame who presented me with the jewels, and to whom we pledged our word that my daughter would be given in marriage to her son. What can I do? For this woman is a mere pauper. Mm, my lord, it is an easy matter to keep off a poor devil such as this. You cannot give your daughter to one that is unknown. By what means shall we put them off? For I have pledged my promise, and the word of the Sultan is unbreakable. This is what I advise. Demand of her son forty platters made of pure gold, mm. piled with gems such as were brought you before. <laughs> Ask for forty white slave girls to carry them, yeah. accompanied by forty black slaves finely dressed. Ah, you have spoken wisely. It is impossible. And by this way shall I be freed of my pledge. They cannot meet the conditions. <laughs> <laughs> Woman, stand forth. The three months have passed, and I am willing to keep my word. Tell thy son that if he will pay the dower of my daughter, he shall have her in marriage. And what is the dower, O Sultan? I require of him a settlement consisting of forty platters of pure gold, all brimming with gems like those given me before. They shall be brought by forty white slave girls with forty black slaves beautifully clothed to escort the bearers. If he meets this condition... Then shall he have the princess to wife. When she heard this, Aladdin's mother returned home, wagging her head at this impossible request. Oh, my son, did I not tell you that your desire for the princess would bring us added sorrow? Tell me, mother, what has happened? Oh, such things are not possible to folk like ourselves. Will the sultan break his pledge? Oh, my child. He will honor his pledge if you will pay the dower for his daughter. Ha! And what is the dower, mother? Forty platters of pure gold, heaped with costly gems, borne by forty slaves with forty escorts. <laughs> the sultan thinks, like you, mother, oh. that such a prodigious dower will be impossible for me to pay. But the dower is far less than I expected. <sighs> Go at once to the marketplace, mother while I consult the slave of the lamp. So she went forth to the bazaar, while Aladdin retired to his chamber and removed the lamp and rubbed it. What is thy wish, O oh master? Fetch me forty platters of purest gold, heaped with costly gems from the hoard in the hidden cavern. The treasure should be borne on the heads of forty white slave girls, attended by forty black slaves. Bring them here to me, and dress them in comely clothes. I hearken and obey, master. In about an hour, the genie returned, bringing all that Aladdin had requested. And when his mother returned from the marketplace, great was her surprise at the house full of slaves and the priceless treasure. All this comes from the wonderful lamp which Allah has seen fit to give unto my son. Oh, mother, it is time for you to return to the sultan with the dower which he requested. Go at once that the grand vizier may see how vainly he has tried to baffle me. So, with Aladdin's mother at the head of the procession, they made their way through the streets to the place of the sultan. 
forty white slave girls, each with an escort, and bearing silver platters heaped with jewels. People stood and gazed at the handmaids, marveling at their beauty and loveliness, for each wore robes inwrought with gold and studded with jewels. And when the nobles at the palace, the emirs and the nabobs and the grandees and the viziers, saw the procession approach. They went in unto the sultan and reported what they saw, and the sultan admitted them at once into his chamber, where each slave saluted him and prayed for his glory and prosperity, placing the bowls of gems at his feet and removing the covers from them. The sultan stood amazed at the beauty of the slaves, and his wits were wildered by the golden bowls of gems. So that he was unable to utter a word. Finally, Aladdin's mother came forward. Oh, my Sultan, this is not much wherewith to honor the princess, for she deserves a hundred times more. <laughs> What do you say now, O Vizier?、Mm. Is not the giver of such gifts worthy to become the Sultan's son-in-law and to have the princess for his wife, sire? The treasures of the universe, all together, are not worth a nail paring of thy daughter. <laughs> o、oh, woman, go to thy son and tell him that I have accepted this bounteous dower, and that the princess shall be his bride tomorrow. This night we shall rejoice at the marriage feast. So let thy son come to me, that I may become familiar with him. <laughs> And was conducted to the banquet hall, where he met the Sultan for the first time. O、oh, our Lord, the Sultan, my tongue is helpless to thank thee for the fullness of the favor, passing all measure, which thou hast bestowed upon me. I do not deserve thy generosity in granting me the hand of thy daughter in marriage. When I look upon thy gifts and upon thy princely beauty and comeliness. I know thou shalt be a fitting companion for the princess, my son. I pray, sire, that thou wilt give me a piece of ground suitable for a pavilion for thy daughter and myself. Look around thee, my son, and choose whatever land you wish that is suitable for your designs. I suggest the broad plain facing my palace, if it please thee, as a fitting spot whereon to build thy pavilion. It shall be finished in the shortest time, my lord. And the princess Badral Badur shall be near to her father.、Ah, come, O、oh、my son, let us repair to the wedding feast. Strike up the music and let the feasting begin. <laughs> After the wedding celebration, Aladdin returned to his chamber and again took down the lamp. He commanded the genie to build in all urgency the pavilion near the palace as the home for the princess Badral Budur. As usual, the genie did as he was instructed, and in one night a pavilion was erected that not even the mightiest monarch on earth could have produced. As the day brightened. The Sultan rose from his sleep, and throwing open the casement, looked out and saw opposite his palace a magnificent pavilion. Thereupon he fell to rubbing his eyes. <laughs> What is there, there, Vizier? Vizier? Yes, sire. You call? Look, behold! <gasps> In very truth. It is a pavilion without equal. <laughs> <laughs> now, now will you believe that Aladdin is worthy to be the husband of the princess, my daughter? Ah, Sultan! Indeed, this 
opulent building is a wonder. But it could not have been built in a single night except by some enchantment. I am surprised to see in thee how thou dost continually harp on evil opinion of Aladdin. Hmm. You were there when I gave him the ground upon which to build a pavilion for the princess. But that it should have been built while we slept, sire. Does it not show him to be an industrious son-in-law? Allah be praised that I have such a one for my daughter. And so that day, Aladdin, the poor tailor's son, married the beautiful princess Badral Budur. And when the bride first saw him from her latticed balcony, she fell headlong in love and was like to fly for joy. And they lived in happiness and splendor in the pavilion near the palace of the sultan. <laughs> Such, then, was the good fortune of Aladdin. But the evil magician who had first taken Aladdin to the cavern in search of the lamp learned by sorcery that Aladdin was not dead, but that he was alive and the possessor of the wonderful lamp. Uh, I have suffered sore pains and agony for the lamp's sake, and this accursed boy has taken it without difficulty. I must needs dig a pit for this Aladdin, the son of a snip, who could not earn for himself even an evening meal. I shall assuredly destroy him and send his mother back to spinning at her wheel. He took his astrological gear and soon discovered that the lamp was in the pavilion and not upon Aladdin's person. Then he prepared himself and set out for the country of Aladdin where he arrived in due time. Soon after his arrival, he went to a coppersmith. Uh, Will you make for me a set of lamps, which I shall describe for you? For the correct price, I fashion whatever you like. Uh, I would have thee hasten to finish them then, for I shall pay you well, my friend. I will do as you say, though I have been much occupied since the marriage of the sultan's daughter to Emir Aladdin, for I do work for the sultan himself. Who is this Aladdin you speak of? Oh, you must be a foreigner, or come from a far country, for his fame has filled the universe, and his pavilion is one of the wonders of the world. Uh, Indeed, I am a foreigner, and have not heard before of this same Aladdin. Surely I must look upon this pavilion, which is such a wonder. I shall have your lamps tomorrow, master, and better lamps you will seldom find. Perhaps, my good friend, perhaps. But there is a lamp that I should sorely love to find, and your lamps may help me find it. The next day, when the lamps were ready, The magician paid the coppersmith and went out into the street bearing the set of lamps in a basket. Presently, he began wandering through the streets and into the marketplace, directing his steps toward the pavilion of Aladdin. New lamps for old, new lamps for old. Who would like to exchange their old lamp for a new lamp? New lamps for old. Surely the old man has lost his wit, suffering new for old. Aye. He's mad, poor devil, but he persists despite the ridicule of those who see him. (laughs) New lamps for old, new lamps for old. Who would like to exchange their old lamp for a new lamp? New lamps for old. Oh, princess, come to the window and see the strange sight. He's calling through the street, then. And what does he say? New lamps for all. Oh, oh. New lamps for all. Look. Who would like to exchange? Giving new lamps new for lamps. all. Oh. Oh. oh, he should do a good business at such a price. I would that we had some old lamps for him. New lamps for Oh, old. oh, my lady. I have noticed in the chamber of my lord Aladdin a certain old lamp. Bring the old lamp, and we shall see if this man is true to his word. If he is, we shall obtain a present for my dear husband, a new lamp for the old one. (laughs) At once, my lady. So the maidservant went forth to Aladdin's chamber and brought away the wonderful lamp, little knowing what she held in her hands. In the meantime, 
princess bade the merchant of the lamps to come in to her. Is it true you are willing to barter a new lamp for an old one, merchant? Uh, it is, O oh princess. Uh, such is my trade. Uh, here is the lamp that I shall give you in exchange for any old lamp that you may have hereabout. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I do wonder at thy wit, fellow. But you've struck a bargain. Ah. Here. Here is an old lamp that I will gladly give for a new one. <laughs> ah, it is such a beautiful antique. You may keep all of the new lamps, old lady. Oh. So saying, the magician placed the enchanted lamp in his breast pocket and departed. Forth through the streets he ran till he was clear of the city. On and on he went over desert ground until night fell and he was alone. Then he took out the lamp and, laughing, rubbed it. What is thy wish? I am the slave of the lamp. I am but one of many. What is thy wish, master? It is my desire that you remove the pavilion of Aladdin with all those within, not forgetting myself and set it down upon my own land in Africa. It shall be done, Lord of the Lamp. Your wish is my command. Close thy eyes, and when you open them, thou shalt find thyself together with the pavilion in Africa. In an eye twinkling, the magician and the pavilion, and all within were transported to Africa. Now it was the custom of the sultan to arise each morning, and when he had shaken off sleep, to open the latticed casement and look out upon the pavilion of his daughter and his new son-in-law. So that day, when he looked out at Aladdin's pavilion, he saw nothing. The ground was as smooth as a well-walked road. Astonishment clothed him as with a garment, and his wits were wildered, and he began to rub his eyes as if still dreaming. Vizier! Vizier! Come here at once! Oh. Yes, sire. What is wrong, O king of the age? You do not know why I rain these tears. Uh, not at all, sir. Then you have not looked in the direction of Aladdin's pavilion this morning. True, oh, my lord. It must still be locked and fast shut. Oh. Gaze out of my window and see if it be locked and fast shut. Hearing is obeying, your majesty. I trust that all is well with... <gasps> Have you learned the reason of my distress? King of the age, I feared that this pavilion and these matters were all magical. Where is Aladdin? He has gone a-hunting. Bring him to me in chains! It shall be done, sir. So the sultan's guard fared forth until they found Aladdin returning from the hunt. And they took him and bound him as the sultan had commanded, begging Aladdin's pardon, for they loved him as did all the people. O oh, my lord, wherein have I sinned against thee? Traitor! Until now I knew of no sin. Vizier, take him and make him look out of my window, and then let him tell us what he sees. When the royal order was obeyed, Aladdin stared upon the empty space, and there was not the faintest trace of an edifice. Then he was brought again to the sultan. What is it thou hast seen? Oh, king of the age, I do not know what has happened. Where is my daughter, the core of my heart, my only child? I know not, sire. You must know. I have pardoned thee only that you go and look into this affair. And if you return without her, by the life of my head, I will cut off the head of thee. To hear is to obey, sire. Grant me forty days, and if I do not find her, then strike off my head and do whatever you wish with me. Your request is granted. But think not you can escape from my hand, for 
I will bring you back, even if you ascended above the clouds to hide thy face. Oh, my lord, if I fail to bring her again, I will present myself to you. I shall not wish to live without thy daughter and my wife. So saying, Aladdin departed. In sorrow, he wandered through the city for two days. Then he strayed into the waste and open lands outside the city walls, not knowing where he went. Aimlessly, he walked until his path led him beside a river, and he thought of casting himself into the water. But as he wrung his hands in despair, he chanced to rub the magical ring. Thy slave between thy hands is come. Ask whatever you want. For I am the slave of him who wears the ring. Oh, 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 slave. I desire that you bring before me my pavilion and all within, and especially the Princess Badralbudur. Oh, master, it is right hard upon me when you demand a service that I cannot perform. Uh, this matter rests with the slave of the lamp, and uh, I dare not meddle with it. Well, I shall not require the impossible of thee. But can thou at least take me up and place me beside my pavilion in whatever land it lies? That I can do, O oh master. Hearing is obeying. Instantly, in an eye glance, the genie whisked Aladdin through the air and set him down beside his pavilion in the land of Africa and upon a spot facing his wife's chambers. Then Aladdin slumbered under a tree, waiting for morning to show her face. When first the sun had touched the tower, the maid of the princess threw open the window and saw, sitting below, her lord Aladdin. She quickly told her mistress, who instructed her to admit him at once since the magician was away. Then Aladdin entered and was met by his wife, and they embraced and exchanged kisses with all delight until they wept for overjoy. Oh, my lady, before all things... It is my desire to ask one question of thee. It was my habit to keep an old copper lamp in my chamber. What has become of it? Oh, my lord, it was this very lamp which led us into this calamity. What happened, my love? When this accursed African came to us, crying, New lamps for old, we did exchange your old copper lamp for a new one. Oh, no. Hardly had we seen another dawn before we found ourselves in this land brought here by, by magic. By means of your lamp. It is the vile magician who once sought my life in an effort to obtain the lamp. Tell me, my lady, what is his desire? Every day he comes to visit me. He begs me to take him as my spouse, telling me that my father has cut off your head in his wrath. And, and he tells me that you were born of pauper parents and were enriched by him. Hmm. But never has he heard one sugar-sweet word from me but only weeping and wailing for loss of thee. Oh, tell me, tell me where he keeps the lamp, my faithful wife. He carries it with him always, for, for he will not leave it for a single hour. Hmm. Oh, my lady, lend thy ear to me, for we shall devise a plan whereby to slay this damned loon. Hear me, mm -hmm. I shall go to the bazaar and purchase a powerful drug. I desire that you dress in your best and cast off all sorrow. Then, when the accursed magician shall visit you, receive him with a smiling face and invite him to come and dine with you. Then, when he is unaware, put the drug into his cup. No sooner shall he drink of it than he will fall upon his back senseless as one dead. It shall be done, as you wish. So the princess Badral Budur summoned her waiting women who robed and arrayed her in her finest raiment and adorned her and perfumed her. When the magician entered, he was overjoyed to see her with a laughing face. If you are willing, sire, do come to me this night and let us dine together. My sorrow has been sufficient, and now my mourning must end. Aladdin would not return to me from the tomb if I were to mourn through a thousand and one nights. I hear and obey, my lady. I will return to thee in all haste. So saying, the magician left, filled with love for the beautiful princess. That night he returned, 
And the fair Batral Budur spoke to him with beguiling speech and sweet terms of hidden meaning. And the magician's longing for her increased, and he was dying of love for her when he saw her address him in such tenderness of words. And his head began to swim, and all the world seemed as nothing in his eyes. Then the princess slipped the drug into her own cup. In our country, there is a custom, but I do not know if it be familiar to you or not. What is it, my dear? Well, at the end of the meal, each lover in turn takes the cup of the beloved and drinks from it. Ah, beautiful custom, yes, yes. <laughs> oh, then give me thy cup, and here is mine, my love. Putting a kiss upon the brim of her own cup, she handed it to the magician. His heart pounded for joy, <laughs> and he took it and raised it to his mouth and drank off the whole contents. Then she drank from his cup. In this way do lovers drink from each other's cup. <laughs> Quick! Call in my lord Aladdin. Go. Go with your handmaids to the innermost rooms and leave me alone here for the present that I may decide what to do. The princess and her attendants left. Then Aladdin arose, and after locking the door, went to the magician and removed the lamp from him. Then he unsheathed his sword and slew the villain. Presently, he rubbed the lamp and summoned the genie. What is thy wish? I am the slave of the lamp. I desire of thee that thou take up my pavilion from this country and transport it to my own land, and there set it down upon the site where it once was. Hearing and obeying, O oh my lord. Now the Sultan never ceased to sorrow for the loss of his daughter. But every hour of every day he would sit and weep for her, because she was his only child. And each morning, day after day, he would arise and hasten to the window and throw it open and peer in the direction where Aladdin's pavilion once stood, and pour forth tears until his eyes were dried up. Now on that day, he arose, as was his custom, looked out, and behold, he saw before him an edifice. Quickly he called for a horse, and without delay set out for the pavilion, and the princess and Aladdin greeted him with tears of joy. Oh, my father, my husband is freed me from the slavery of that accursed magician, and how we are returned... I know not, my father, except Aladdin has done it. Oh, pardon me, O oh my son, for I was about to destroy thy life because of this damned enchanter. O oh, king of the time, you did nothing contrary to the holy law. All the trouble came from the accursed magician, but he is no more. After he was slain, I called forth the slave of the lamp, who carried the pavilion here again. This day shall be the beginning of a great festival. For a full month of 30 days shall we hold a celebration in honor of the Princess Padral Budur and her husband Aladdin. And Aladdin abode with his wife, the Lady Badral Budur, in all pleasures and joy. And when the Sultan died, his son-in-law was seated upon the throne of the kingdom, and he dealt justly with the people, so that all the folk loved him. And he lived with his wife in peace and happiness until he too died. And the tale is also told about... Shahrazad 
finished her tale and began another. The sun rose upon the day. But the sultan was so pleased with the story that he did not slay the beautiful Scheherazade that he might hear another tale another time. <laughs>